द रेप ऑफ द लॉक हियर रेप मीन्स थेफ्ट और स्टीलिंग समथिंग एंड लॉक मीन्स a part of the hair which you curl like this look i made it already this is lock so if someone cuts this this will be called the rape of my lock <laughs> the rape of the lock composed by alexander pope published in the year 1712 anonymously in lintot's miscellaneous poems and translations in two cantos the rape of the lock then you know if now the question comes how many cantos are there in the rape of the lock so you have to tick mark 5 not 2 originally it had 2 but then the final version 1714 will have five cantos written by mr pope his name comes and finally in 1717 there was an edition of clarissa's speech on good humor basically there's a character in this poem called as clarissa she will give a speech so in 1717 the cantos were five only but clarissa's speech was added so do you understand 1712 anonymously in two cantos 1714 five cantos by mr pope 1717 five cantos with an addition of clarissa's speech poet the little man alexander pope setting 18th century london the elite class society which had nothing to think of other than which party to attend what clothes to wear what hairstyle to make what lipstick and rouge to apply okay this is all their life was getting ready for the evening party sleeping waking up late morning and then again preparing for the party for that night this is what the rape of the lock setting will be 18th century london and hampton court themes are first major theme is beauty is fragile second masculinity versus femininity and third the supernatural you will be introduced to sylphs basically to nymphs to gnomes i'll tell you everything the genre of the rape of the lock is it is a mock heroic narrative poem in heroic couplets and also it's a high burlesque basically the topic you know the piece is serious but then the topic that they are dealing with is very trivial the topic will be the rape of the lock but the way they deal with this rape is going to be very serious that is high burlesque uh, before we begin the poem you should know that this poem is based on a real life incident which was narrated to alexander pope by his friend john carrel so john carrel once told alexander pope about a man named lord petre who cut off his suitor arabella farmer's lock of hair so these are real people lord petre even he's a gentleman in a party he cut off arabella farmer's lock of hair he was in fact her suitor but they did not get married in this poem the names of the characters will change but they are based on real characters so in this poem lord petre will become the baron whereas arabella farmer will become belinda easy are we ready to begin before the canto start the poem begins with a dedication or a letter so the rape of the lock begins with a letter who has written this letter alexander pope to whom to the real lady arabella farmer because he is taking the subject matter from arabella farmer so he tells arabella farmer that dear ma'am i have chosen to write about you why i chose you as a subject why i have published this work and also i want to dedicate the rape of the lock to you arabella that is how the poem begins with this we are in a very good position to start with the first canto out of the five cantos of the rape of the lock because the poem is very long in this poem i haven't given you the text just few important lines there are many important lines but then i can say just few lines i have taken from the text but don't worry explanation is going to be complete you will have a good idea you know for your exam if you want to write in detail about it you will be able to write if you follow my video what happens in canto 1 belinda is introduced she is this charming young beautiful wealthy girl belongs to the upper class 18th century england it is late morning or i can say early afternoon and she just wakes up with the lap dog sleeping next to her she cuddles her lap dog whose name is shock she loves shock 
Now, Belinda remembers vaguely that, you know, in her dream last night, she dreamt of this young man who was whispering love notes in her ears. After this, we are introduced with a guardian spirit or this airy spirit or nymph who guards Belinda. The name of this spirit is Ariel. Ariel watches over Belinda's safety and he showed a dream of warning to her last night. So there was one more dream that Ariel showed to Belinda about some dread event impends. These italics are lines from the poem, some dread event impends. Basically, a dreadful thing is about to happen. Ariel does not know what dreadful thing, but then he knows that something bad will happen on that day what we'll come to know. Then after this, Ariel also introduces the sylphs and the gnomes who will play very important part later in the poem. Easy. So we've been introduced with to Belinda, to Ariel, sylphs and gnomes. Now Ariel is fully awake from her sleep and remember she has to attend a party again this day. So she rings for her maid, Betty. Betty comes inside and they start preparing for that day's decoration of Belinda. Decoration of Belinda. Basically, the sylphs and Betty, who's a maid, they get Belinda dressed for the day. So literally, these sylphs who are invisible to the human beings, they help Belinda making her face, her hair, her sleeves, her gown, her petticoat, everything. They make it beautifully. They help her. You know, they are like her hairdresser, her costume designer, her fashion designer, these sylphs. And this is when she gets the hairstyle in which there are two locks of hair. So these are two locks and very beautifully, you know, they hang from behind her neck, her neck. With this, we start with Canto 2. The very attractive and rich Belinda, who is all ready for the party, is sitting on a boat and she's proceeding. You know, she's on River Thames. She's going to attend an elite party at Hampton Court. Hampton Court is a country residence of the royal family. Her hairstyle of the day includes, as I told you, two beautiful curling locks, coat which graceful hung behind. So they are literally hanging from behind two locks of hair. Ariel Sylph again feels that this is not going to be a very pleasant evening. So he commands the other Sylphs that something terrible is about to happen. I don't know what, but then you have to guard Belinda very closely. You have to guard her, no matter she forget her prayers or miss a masquerade or lose her heart or necklace at the ball. But please guard her properly. Ariel tells this to the sylphs. They all are guarding Belinda. With this, we start with Canto 3 out of Canto 5 of The Rape of the Lock. The party scene starts. Belinda is at the party. She is absolutely enjoying the evening. She's sipping coffee, which was a sign of novelty in 18th century England. She's chatting with her friends. And after that, she's invited to play this card game of ombre, which resembles the heart game, card game of ombre with her suitor. Here is where the Baron will be introduced. The Baron is a suitor. Basically, she and, sorry, she means Belinda and he, the Baron, they might or might not marry. Suitor means somebody who is suitable. So he's a suitor as well as opponent in this game of ombre. So Belinda on one side, the Baron on the other side, and again, that mock heroic scene. This game of ombre is literally described as a metaphorical battle between Belinda and the Baron. But Baron has another plans. Of course, he's playing the game, but then his mind is working somewhere else. What is he thinking? He's scheming to steal one of Belinda's two locks of hair. do locks hai, se ek lock mera, the Baron says. Why? Why does Baron want it? Baron till now had whatever love affairs. What he does is at his house, he has built an altar. On this altar, he places all the trophies of his former loves. So because he finds this lock of hair no less than a trophy, it's very valuable. He thinks I will cut it, put it on the altar. And you know, sooner or later, 
actually the baron burns all these things. So he admires Belinda's pretty locks of hair and prays, quote, soon to obtain and long possess the lock. Do you understand the scene here? Canto 3 continues. In the game of ombre, Belinda wins, but then the truth is, in reality, the Baron will win. How? Baron quickly goes and borrows a pair of scissors from Clarissa. Clarissa is a friend of Belinda, but enemy also. So, you, you know, we can give her the term frenemy. <laughs> so Clarissa, you know, gives a pair of scissors to Baron. And because Belinda is so nicely guarded by the sylphs, Baron fails three times. Three times he tries to cut that lock of hair, but without any success. Only after three times, he successfully manages to cut off Belinda's lock of hair. Oh no! Imagine someone cutting your hair at a party. And you know, it's written that accidentally, the Baron cuts a sylph also into two pieces, but then the Pope tells the readers, do not worry because the airy substance soon unites again. And because the sylph is an airy substance, it will unite again. Here he parodies a passage from Milton's Paradise Lost. Who? Alexander Pope. With this canto four of the rape of the log begins. Belinda is in hysteria, tantrum, hysterical state, phonetic, frantic, She's gone crazy because of the rape of her lock. Just then, she falls into the arms of Thelestris, this lady. And who helps her cry more? A gnome is introduced here, a resentful gnome whose name is Umbriel. Umbriel helps Belinda achieve this hysteria or tantrum even more. How? Important. Umbriel travels down or goes down to the underworld called as Cave of Spleen, there the queen is sitting on her throne. So from the queen, Umbriel takes, picks up, listen to lines from the poem, sighs, sobs, and passions, and the war of tongues, and a while filled with fainting fears, soft sorrows, melting griefs, and flowing tears. Umbriel returns with all this and empties all this over the head of Belinda, and also on the head of Thelestris, because Belinda is in the arms of Thelestris. Because of getting all this sighs, sobs, passions, war of tongue, fainting fears, soft sorrows, melting grief, slowing tears, Belinda is only shouting, crying, shouting, crying. And she also has that war of tongue. So she begins a war with the Baron. Although Belinda's frenemy, Clarissa, tries to convince her that it is okay, it was just a prank. It is just a lock of hair. It will regrow. Come on, take it in good spirit, Belinda. But Belinda wants to take revenge. And therefore, the mock battle begins with, quote, glares, songs, and wits as weapons. So the weapons used are glares, songs, and wits. She throws snuff up the Baron's nose to subdue him. This is Canto 5. And in this battle, it seems that Belinda and her side of people are winning. She demands for the lock of hair from the Baron, who is not at all apologetic. Baron says, it's okay. This lock of hair is mine. But then ultimately, the lock of hair is gone. It's not there. This is a tragedy for Belinda, for everyone. Where did this lock of hair go? The raped lock of hair goes missing. What happens to it? It turns into a constellation. Constellation up in the sky, destined to outlast all these contestants. This Belinda, this Baron, this Clarissa, these, you know, human people. Basically, this lock of hair is now heavenly. It's become a constellation. Up, up, it rises up. <laughs> Supernatural. So now Pope ends the poem saying so much drama, so much madness for nothing. So Alexander Pope ends the poem with the conclusion that it is him who is victorious in this battle. It is not Belinda or the Baron. It is Pope who is victorious. Why? Because he has written a commendable poem 
commemorating the loss of the lock and it is his poetry which will be cherished for generations to come. Just like you and I, after centuries, are reading To the Rape of the Lock, enjoying it and of course remembering Alexander Pope. So Pope says that poetry and I have won and not vanity. Not vanity, not show off, not pomp, not glamour. Did you like it? It was so nice. You have to comment. Comment right now. Points to ponder. First important point. In reality, Arabella Firmer and Lord Petre, they never married because Arabella married to another gentleman with whom she had five sons. Sylphs, who are an important part of this poem, were an inspiration of Alexander Pope taken from the 17th century French novel called Comte de Gabelis. Comte de Gabelis. Pope wrote this poem pseudonymously, as I told you, that, you know, the first edition was without his name on it. So the pseudonym was Esdras Barnivelt. This was the name Pope used to write this poem, Esdras Barnivelt. And also pseudonymously, Pope wrote another poem called A Key to the Lock in 1714, which is a humorous warning. This key to the lock is a humorous warning that do not take the rape of the lock too seriously. Do not take it too seriously. A question. Justify that the rape of the lock is a mock heroic narrative or also called as a storm in a teacup. Imagine in a teacup, there's a storm or a mock heroic narrative. I'll give you a few answers to justify. First, the abduction of Helen of Troy is compared to the theft of the lock or the rape of the lock. Second, gods become these minute sylphs who are guarding Belinda. Third, Achilles' shield, Achilles' shield is compared to Belinda's petticoat. And fourth, Pope imitates lines from Homer's Iliad and Milton's Paradise Lost. With this, we are done with the rape of the lock. If you liked it, comment. Do share this video with your friends and relatives. And yes, subscribe to our channel, Walat by Dr. Kalyani Walat. This is Hina from Team Walat. Take very good care of yourself. Bye-bye.